Woods, a local inventor, locked himself away, day in, day out, and one day would revolutionise the industrial age. But does he still haunt the corridors of Halleth Wood? Welcome to In the Unknown. Built in 1480, our home for the next half hour is Harleth Wood. And according to the many visitors, it's not only our home, but also home to a variety of ghostly goings on and an 18th century scandal. For the next half hour, we'll be introducing you to some of the most notorious ghosts and unexplained activity between these ancient walls. And I'll be also sending three of my paranormal investigators out onto the road to report back from some of the most mysterious locations in the Northwest, all of which are open to the general public. Every week, we'll be based in one of the region's most haunted hotspots, and today's episode finds us in Horlith Wood in Bolton. Horlith Wood began its life when wealthy clothier Lawrence Brownlow decided that due to all of his hard work selling cloth to local merchants, he would reward himself with a grand home. His family remained in the home for three generations, with Brownlow's grandson adding a new wing in the year 1591. Due to the Brownlow's waning fortunes, the building was sold to the Norris family in 1639, and the Norris family had this beautiful southwest extension made with stone. In 1697, family life at the hall was to change completely when the rooms were let out individually. It was a kind of early apartment block with people paying rent and it had quite a famous tenant. This is Samuel Crompton, inventor and regarded by many as a wizard. We'll be hearing more of his legacy later in the programme. In the 19th century, when the house was let to the Bromley family, it was in a considerable state of disrepair, and after it was partly damaged in a landslip in 1890, sections of it were rebuilt. But it was perhaps too late. Hollithwood fell into dereliction, but its saviour was to come in the form of Lord Leverhulme. Leverhulme bought the building in 1889. A year later, he donated it to Bolton Corporation, along with a sizeable fund for the cost of restoration. Opened as a museum in 1902, it's now where we pick up the story. Along with the fine paintings and furniture, it seems that Harleth Wood is a paranormal hotspot, with some of its former residents refusing to leave. In certain areas of the hall, uh, we picked up on certain energies, let's say. Especially one uh, was a young girl, about 18 years old, um, dressed in clothing from the 1800s, early 1800s. Uh, she was very upset. Um, she seemed it. She looked as though she'd been crying. And she suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Um, we watched her and she didn't walk. She like glided through and then disappeared as soon as she appeared. And it was all over in, what, five, six seconds. We'll be catching up with a few ghosts in the past in just a minute, but first Andy Bonner is in Sandbach on the trail of a centuries-old religious relic. Now all I have written down is that we're here to promote one of the oldest monuments in Cheshire. But to be honest, I'm struggling with these rather cryptic clues. Older than all the local people. Well, it could be the director, I suppose. Older than the oldest building here. Directed to Carl, maybe. Uh, there's a big one and a smaller one and they're covered in scratches. Of course, it must be the 9th century Saxon crosses. During the 7th century, the Anglo-Saxon settlement of Sandbach was in the pagan kingdom of Mercia. Legend has it that King Pender of Mercia arranged the marriage of his son Pader to Princess Augfleda, the daughter of Oswy, the king of Northumbria. And here the story begins. We have here at Sandbach two of the very earliest and rarest of the stone crosses to survive from Anglo-Saxon England that remain in the country. 
They would originally have been very, very brightly painted, highly polychromed with pieces of bright shining metal and bits of paste glass inset with them. So very, very eye-catching in their original condition. We have a number of Christian scenes carved on these crosses, really as a means of the church trying to display its establishment in the region and its very, very high status. A number of these scenes include the crucifixion, which um, shows Christ on the cross, uh, filling and quartering the field of decoration, which refers to the universal nature of the Christian religion in England. Below it is a nativity showing the birth of Christ, and on the other side of this cross we have Christ being led to Calvary, to the crucifixion, with his arms bound by a rope, being led by a soldier, and below him, Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross. So this is where it all started then. It was in this very brook where King Penda forced his son Peder to be baptised and to accept Christianity. Now there's some doubt over when the crosses were first erected. One view is that it was during Peder's lifetime in 653 AD. Most records, though, indicate that they were actually completed during the 9th century. But around 800 years later, the crosses were in for a rather rude awakening. In the 17th century, a group of Puritan iconoclasts devout on removing any religious symbology smashed up the crosses and scattered the pieces across the region. And there they remained until 1816, when the Cheshire historian Dr George Ormrod took it upon himself to collect the pieces and to resurrect this amazing record for future generations to cherish. The crosses are located in Sandbach Town Centre, with the church in Brook just a short walk down the road. Different areas of the hall, of the establishment, produce or seem to hold different energies, different feelings, different of different calibres, all relating more or less to the same, what we would term as paranormal phenomena. People would experience a heavy touching sensation maybe in one area of the building, whilst in another area would be a small uplifting experience, maybe a small draft on the back of the neck, maybe the feeling of a touch. These are all general symptoms of, of energies that usually we feel that may be incorporated in different parts of the building. Perhaps the most famous former resident at Hollithwood was Samuel Crompton, and it's in these very rooms that his invention was created. We came along here to this establishment here. We came with about 30 people. We divided into two groups, two groups of 15. We were split up throughout the, uh, throughout the, the venue. We did perform seances as a way of contacting any energies and spirits outside. We like to term them as energies. Um, obviously, we, we show the respect because we have to treat energies as we would ourselves, as people. Well, I believe that Samuel uh, Crompton may still walk the corridors here, may still uh, come back here in visitation. Obviously, um, it was his home, it was his residence, so he, he would be um, attracted to, to return back in visitation to a place where a sense of belonging, as it were. Samuel moved here when he was a young boy with his mother and father. His father died when Samuel was quite young, um, leaving him, his mother and his sisters. He came about inventing the mule, to help himself really. He was doing it out of you know, his own need, it would help him, he could spin a lot more cotton off his mule. He wasn't happy with, with the equipment they had, so he set about designing his own machine, which would spin a lot better cotton yarn. And at the age of 26, he invented the spinning mule. And this revolutionised the cotton industry because the yarn that they produced was as fine as the yarn that was coming from India. The legacy of Samuel Crompton is very apparent. Walking through the rooms he once toiled, but did he ever leave? The spinning wheel works by squashing and stretching the cotton yarn as it's fed through. There's sets of rollers that move to and fro on the machine, so that means the yarn is a lot finer consistency than any of the machines were able to produce at that time. 
It is said that Crompton spent many hours on here working day and night to create his invention. He was considered by others to be a conjurer or a wizard, but when he finally unveiled his invention, the spinning mule, his fame grew, and this was pivotal in securing Bolton's future as the centre of the Industrial Revolution. The spinning mule had a massive impact on the industry in the North West. Um, in 1810, Crompton did a survey of all the factories in Lancashire and found that 80% of cotton in Lancashire was produced on a spinning mule. About a year ago, we had a, a gentleman come to the hall who said that he could sense the spirit of Samuel Crompton in this building, throughout this building. He wasn't specific about which room, but he also said that um, Crompton was obviously happy and contented. So, are the sightings real? Could Samuel Crompton have any unfinished business here? Or is he simply too attached to the room that made him a star? It is said that Samuel walked straight through the walls, a throwback to when the layout of the house was slightly different. He is also said to be a friendly, happy spirit, who means no harm. So if you visit, don't be scared. He might just want to say hello. After the break, we'll be looking at more of Hallinth Wood and discover an 18th century scandal. Caroline Hacking has a tale of dragons and wizards. And Darren Hutchinson explores the origins of gargoyles. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back to Into the Unknown. And coming up, we have dragons, gargoyles and scandal. But first, you find me here in the master bedroom. And according to visitors to Hoylith Wood, it's the most unsettling part of the building. Children are known to burst into tears when into the room, and adults have reported feeling very anxious. Visitors to the hall, there's been a couple of occasions where they've said they've seen feet almost trapped underneath a bed in the Brownlow bedroom, which is, is one of the only few things really what has made me think, because we have got very early plans from the 1800s of there being a staircase leading directly underneath the bed. People used to enter that room through a staircase because when it was let out to tenements, you know, they didn't want to disturb the other people in the house. We're assuming that staircase was taken out in 1889 or between that and the early 1900s. And, you know, that if that plan's from the archives, not a lot of people might have seen that plan, so it is quite odd. This room would have had many residents over the course of its history. But did something happen here that is better off not being remembered? It seems so. The master bedroom has caused a lot of comments from our visitors. We've had quite a few who've said that they've not wanted to go in that room. And we've had um, children who've started to cry when they've got to the doorway. And we've had people reporting um, seeing the ghost of an old lady in that room. But it's a funny room in the building because it's very cold and it's kind of off at an angle from the rest of the building and it's very dark, which I think contributes to the uneasy feeling that people have. The trustees had a problem with water mysteriously appearing on the floor. While we did one of our investigations here, we discovered that there's a well in the middle of this building um, stemming back a couple of hundred years ago. Um, when we told the trustees this, they were quite taken aback. They confirmed something that we had no prior knowledge of. And now it's time to join Caroline Hacking in North Wales as she learns you should always take the advice of a wizard. This picture postcard scene in Betsy Coed in the Welsh countryside is the setting to a story that has been told through countless generations about a man who died three times. Many years ago, in a time long since faded to dust, the villagers of Betsy Coed lived in constant fear and danger of falling victim to the fire-breathing dragon that stalked their quaint little community. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Finally, after suffering at the hands of this seemingly invincible foe, a man came forward known only as the Hirathog Bandit. He promised to rid the community once and for all of this evil winged monster and restore peace and restfulness where danger and fear previously existed. Upon setting out on his quest, the bandit sought the counsel of the local wizard for advice on how to defeat such a beast. 
However, rather than come to his aid with tales of dragons slain in the past, instead the wizard warned the man not to go out on such a journey fraught with danger, for if he did, he would die three times. When he heard this, the bandit dismissed such claims as pure nonsense and laughed at the old man as he left the wizard's lair to begin his hunt for the one they say cannot be killed. After many days and seemingly endless nights, the dragon was finally spotted on top of a sharp rock face. But just as the bandit was about to strike his fatal blow into the very soul of the beast, with lightning reactions, the creature sank his giant teeth deep into his flesh. As he battled for his life, he lost his footing and tumbled over the edge, heading for the water 200 feet below. As he fell, a rock edge tore into his throat and ripped it apart. His ordeal did not end there though, as he crashed into the river and drowned beneath the waves. His body was never found. Some say that the dragon still lives to this day, while others say he died of natural causes after his encounter with the fearless bandit. So next time you choose to visit Swallow Falls, just check in the water, because you never know what you're going to find. Fire. Swallow Falls is located on the A5 just outside Betsy Coed and is open all year round. You'll need a pound coin each to operate the automatic turnstile. These are the attic rooms, sometimes out of bounds to visitors, but not to the ghost of one young lady who is seen here on a regular basis by members of staff. We've had reports of the ghost of a young girl in the attics, probably in Georgian servant's costume, so apron and a long woolen dress. Apparently she's very unhappy and there's been some suggestion that she's either been murdered or committed suicide. Apparently she's not alone. The apparition of an elderly gentleman wearing a wing collar and a black suit has been seen here along with the normal drop in temperatures that you associate with paranormal activity. Nobody knows who these individuals are, but certainly their ghostly presence means that staff will only come up here when they need to. Now, atop most gothic buildings, you'll find gargoyles, and Darren Hutchinson explores the reality of them. There's a parish church deep in the heart of the Northwest, where it's not just the good Lord who's looking out for the well-being of the building. Quaint sound in Littlebury near Rochdale may not sound like the kind of place that needs protecting from evil spirits, but back in 1815, the designers and planners of this beautiful parish were not taking any chances. Way up high, surrounding the roof of the church, are an army of grotesque looking gargoyles, who it is said, by being outside of the building looking away, symbolise the safe positive haven within the church. But are gargoyles something more sinister altogether? As any reader of the Da Vinci Code will know, gargoyles take their name from the French word gargoulier, which literally means to gurgle. The sound a gargoyle makes when its spout is full of water. Many theories suggest that the gargoyles on the outside of the church were representations of all the beasts and evil the church has triumphed over, a sort of moose's head on the wall of a hunter's cabin. Believed by many historians to be purely for decorative purposes, a gargoyle can be fashioned into a human grotesque, a beast or a demon. Superstitious builders felt that if a building under their construction were not to have gargoyles on, there would be nothing to scare away the demons who would be planning to knock down the walls of any church or cathedral. The gargoyles here in Littleborough are working well. There's no sign that after almost 200 years of standing that the demons will triumph and push over the walls of the church. Or will they? Littleborough Parish Church can be found on the side of the A58 in the village of Littleborough near Rochdale. The graveyard is accessible all year round. This is the Great Hall, site of more hauntings than any other part of the building. It's said a great meal took place here, and as the family sat down to eat the meal, the youngest son entered the room. His face suddenly changed from a young man to an old man, and after some unexplainable mutterings, he suddenly turned back to a young man again. 
In the kitchens adjacent to this main hall, the sightings of a little old woman are now taken for granted by the many visitors here. Apparently she is very friendly and fits in with the surroundings. Here, on the stairs, is said to be the spirit of a Christmas-loving cavalier. Every year, on the 12 days after December the 25th, he is said to walk up, but never down. It's one day when I was coming into the building through the main door and the staircase opposite, I thought I saw a pair of feet running up the stairs and I assumed it was one of my colleagues going upstairs to help a visitor or something. But everybody who was at work that day was down here in the office so I don't know what that was at all, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what I saw. The Cavalier is said to be one of a family of royalists who had their property confiscated during the Civil War. Always said to be in a hurry, it is thought that he met his fate at the top, where he was apprehended and killed. He never came back down the stairs alive. Alongside this Christmas spirit, something more sinister was discovered by the Club Zero Ghost Club. During one of um, one of our group's operations, um, a young girl was picked up um, spiritually, who uh, was believed to be pregnant. Um, she proclaimed herself to be uh, to be called Mary, and um, we, we was asking specific questions on this scale to try and find as much information as we possibly could. And um, apparently, she was um, with child to the master. Of the of the property, obviously, in them days that would have caused some form of a scandal. So a, a lot of documentation would be quite hard to find. This story has never been proven, but perhaps with all this negative feeling, it may be responsible for unsettling the atmosphere here at Hollith Wood. Hopefully, you won't be too scared to visit us. Hollith Wood can be located just north of Bolton Centre and is well signposted from the A58. There is a very small entrance fee with concessions for children and the hall is open all year round for the majority of the week with the doors open just at the weekends out of peak season. That's it for this week's In the Unknown. Good night.